My name is Kara Stein, and I'm one of the five mem board members of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. I'm joined this morning by all of my fellow board members, Chair Erica Williams, uh, board members Dwayne Desparti, Christina Ho, and Tony Williams. And the board is very pleased to welcome all of the members of our new advisory group. I will be serving as the facilitator of today's investor advisory group meeting. Uh, ultimately, our investor advisory group will be chaired by two individuals. One will be the PCAOB's newly announced investor advocate, Ms. Saba Kumar. The other co-chair will be one of the members of the advisory group itself. So it is my hope that we'll be able to land on a co-chair selection process by the end of today, and then the PCOB will help the uh, investor advisory group members implement it. Um, to start out, I'm gonna turn over the uh, floor to Chair Williams and my fellow board members to make brief opening comments, and then I will resume uh, facilitating the meeting at that point. Thank you, board member Stein, for the introduction um, and for graciously agreeing to serve as the acting IEG co-chair. I really appreciate all the work that you and your staff have done um, to make this um, meeting possible today and, and to prepare for it. Um, as you mentioned, yesterday we issued a press release that announced Saba um, Kumar has been appointed as the new investor advocate. It's a newly created role. And Saba is gonna be responsible for maintaining and expanding the PCAOB's engagement with the investor community, as well as serving as this group, the IAG's primary point of contact. She's gonna be joining the PCAOB on July 11th, and she is a dedicated public servant, as you can tell from her background, and she brings a wealth of experience interacting and working with consumers, investors, and investor advocates. We're really thrilled to um, bring Saba on board. And I'm also really thrilled, and it's a great pleasure to be with you all here today as we kick off this very first meeting of the Investor Advisory Group. The only thing that would make today even more special would be if we were be able to be with you in person, and I'm really hopeful that that will be able to happen very soon. Reconstituting the PCAOB's advisory groups, including this Investor Advisory Group, was a top priority for me and the board. And that's why in less than a month after my arrival, we put the wheels in motion, seeking comment on the potential structure for this advisory group and initiating the nomination process, which ultimately um, led to the, making this day a reality. I can't emphasize enough how critical your voice is to this board. We are keenly focused on investor protection and our investor protection mission. And to that end, we're really interested to hear your perspectives and ideas on key areas of concern and on potential emerging issues relating to the PCAOB's oversight activities. I look forward to working collaboratively with you and advancing the PCAOB's mission. You're an invaluable resource for us, and I really thank you for volunteering to be part of this group. Um, in addition to my thanks to board member Stein and her staff, I also wanna thank the other talented PCOB board, um, staff members who assisted in preparing for today's meeting, including Kent Bonham and the um, members of his staff in external affairs. And then there are lots of other staff members you'll hear from today. And so just thanks to all of you for all of the work you've put in. Thanks, Kara. I think you're on mute. Uh, board member Dwayne Desparti. Yeah, thank you, Kara. Good morning. And uh, I echo Erica and Kara in welcoming each of you to our first meeting today. And uh, really thank you for stepping up to serve in, uh, as Erica has said, and Kara has said, this very important role. I also want to thank Kara for facilitating today's meeting, thank the staff, and uh, also thank Erica and the entire uh, board, my colleagues, for prioritizing our engagement with the investor community. Um, you know, the breadth and depth of the expertise and experience that you collectively bring to us is really impressive. And, you know, like many of you, I've devoted my career to high quality financial reporting for the benefit of investors and, and other stakeholders. I was a former auditor, chief accounting officer, and now a regulator. 
investors are core to our mission and your insights are going to just be invaluable in helping us better understand the needs of investors the state of audit quality from your perspective and the state of our programs the effectiveness of our programs your advice will guide us in our standard setting and other regulatory policy decision making so again thank you for being here thank you for your commitment going forward i'm excited to uh excited and look forward to engaging with each of you as uh, as we move ahead. With that, back to you, Carol. Thanks. I'm going to now turn over the mic to board member Christina Ho. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to the first meeting of the newly reconstituted Investor Advisory Group of the PCOB. I want to thank board member Stein for serving on a temporary basis as IAG co-chair. I also want to really recognize her indefatigable commitment to investor protection. I've served on the PCOB board with her for almost seven months. Kara, I've learned much from you about the many facets of investor protection and investor confidence, and I'm grateful for your leadership in this area and for your friendship. The PCOB created the IAG in 2009 under the leadership of then board member Stephen Harris and it met for the first time in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Those dark days serve as a reminder that investor confidence is fragile. If we go back further in time to 2002, Congress faced an incredible loss of investor confidence in the financial markets stemming from the collapse of Enron and other public companies. The accounting scandals at Enron shattered trust in both the auditing fashion profession and the financial disclosure system. But to its great credit, Congress rose to the challenge. It understood that to regain investor confidence, it had to do something audacious, something that would make clear that conditions that allow Enron to happen would not happen again. Congress acted in a bipartisan manner and passed Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. First and foremost in Sarbanes-Oxley is the establishment of the PCLB, which resulted in one of the first independent regulators in the world responsible for setting auditing and other standards, inspecting public company auditors across the globe for compliance with those standards and enforcing those standards. Before I joined the PCOB, I worked as an auditor at a large firm. I later served as a standard setter while working at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and I also am a retail investor. Wearing each of those three hats, I believe that the PCOB's investor protection mission would be achieved by ensuring quality audits of public companies. I also believe that by fulfilling our mission of investor protection, that investor confidence would naturally ensue. Thanks to Chair Williams and IAG Co-Chair Stein, I understand better that maintaining investor confidence requires more than just setting standards, inspecting compliance with our standards, and taking enforcement action. Maintaining investor confidence requires continuous outreach to investors and listening to and taking appropriate action in response to investor concerns. And that's where you come in. Now, I have a keen interest in leveraging data and technology for the public good, and I have given a lot of thought to how to bolster investor and other stakeholder confidence in the PCLB. I look forward to hearing your ideas on this topic in the months and years ahead. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Christina. Um, board member Tony Williams. Tony, I think you're on mute. Uh, good day to everyone and uh, good morning um, and those in other time zones uh, welcome you as well. Uh, I'm Tony Thompson, um, uh, the uh, newest board member, and I join my colleagues in thanking you for your willingness to serve uh, U.S. investors in this important capacity. As I've shared in other venues, I'm a firm believer that the Investor Advocate Group deserves its own voice, space, and platform. 
Moreover, I believe the IG is critical to PCALB's ability to achieve its mission. Throughout my professional career, I have been steeped in the operations of large multifaceted organizations. I've held various positions of responsibility, leading vast, complex, and fast-paced governance processes with many stakeholders. The common theme for all of the roles I've served was leading the charge in protecting the American public and sustaining a way of life. In each of these roles, I not only had to master the subject matter areas and policy implications of what these organizations did, but by necessity, I became a process guy. And as a process guy, I have come to understand the successful outcomes are dictated in large part by how an organization goes about systematically achieving its desired goals. More often than not, the best decisions are made by better, uh, rigorous processes of gathering the views of all relevant stakeholders. Here at the PCOB, the views of our investor stakeholders are key. Thus, the work of the IAG will be instrumental in helping the PCOB fulfill its investor protection mandate. I look forward to your input today on our strategic plan and standard setting agenda, as well as your ongoing engagement on ways to improve our programs and how to best accomplish our mandate to protect and serve investor interests. I close with a thank you to board member Stein and her staff. She's done a fabulous job uh, getting us here today, as well as the staff in our Office of Chief Auditor, Office of General Counsel, and Office of External Affairs who have worked hard to plan this meeting today. Thank you all. Thank you, Tony. I'm gonna keep my remarks short um, because ultimately the purpose of this meeting is to hear from you, investors. This is the beginning of that dialogue. Today we will have a series of presentations to sort of be level setting, but ultimately I, I think these meetings will be very interactive and uh, focused on your research, your best thoughts about what the PCOB should be doing in various settings. Uh, you can tell from everyone's comments today, you are critical to our work at the PCOB. Our mission is to serve you. <laughs> The PCOB was created to protect investors and further the public interest in preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports. Many of you have been working in the investment field for quite some time. You remember the dot-com bubble. You remember Enron, WorldCom. Might as well throw the financial crisis in there as well. The ensuing lack of confidence and trust in public company financial statements has cascaded across the financial system several times in our lifetime with adverse effects on both American households and American growth and innovation. Uh, early in the century, um, the dot-com bubble, Enron, WorldCom, did it affect the ability of Americans to retire? Yes. Did it impact the ability of Americans to send their children to college? Yes. Did it impact the development of goods and services, such as new medicines and technologies? Yes. So that's why what we're doing is important. And I think June is an auspicious time for us to meet. The Public Company Accounting Reform and Investor Protection Act, commonly known as Sarbanes-Oxley, became law in July 2002, 20 years ago. But June was the critical month. The bill passed out of the Senate Banking Committee with the unexpected support of 17 out of the 21 committee members in the middle of June. The collapse of WorldCom two weeks later basically swept opposition to its passage away. Later in July, the bill became law after nearly unanimous support from both the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act reminds auditors that their duty under the law is to serve, first, the interest of investors. It makes it clear that the PCOB's core mission is investor protection. And this history reminds us that investor perspectives must inform the board's work. Simply put, investors 
are our customers. Some of the questions that face us 20 years after the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley still sound familiar. How can we further confidence in audit reports? Are auditors fit for purpose? How can investors judge the quality of the financial reports they receive? What information could help investors evaluate the audit? Other questions are newer, but no less important. In a world drowning in digital data, what role does the independent auditor have? What are the risks of increased use of electronic auditing combined with the reductions in the size of audit teams? Finally, I wanna emphasize that this is your group. You will set the agenda. You will rank the topics and run your deliberations. I know that you all care about audit quality and trust in the capital markets. That is why you're here. And we look forward to your insights and guidance. So I wanna thank Chair Williams, my fellow board members for their statements and uh, all of their support uh, for the uh, Investor Advisory Group. I thought I would start out with a very quick overview of the agenda and then we'll uh, uh, get, uh, you know, roll right into uh, presentations by several of the PCOB staff members. So our first agenda, um, because this is the first meeting, we're going to provide everybody with an overview of the Investor Advisory Group's charter and its new powers, such as the selection of a co-chair from amongst the group's members, the ability to form subcommittees and or task forces, and some of the member responsibilities. The next agenda item will be an overview of some of the work of the PCOB. We'll hear from Barb Vanich, who's the Acting Chief Auditor and Director of Professional Standards. We will hear from George Bodick, our Director of the Division of Registration and Inspections, and then Bill Ryan, who's the Deputy Director of our Division of Enforcement and investigations. Then we'll have lunch. Part of our lunch will be a working lunch with an ethics overview, and that will be offline. And then after lunch, we'll resume our meeting and we'll have a session on the PCAOB's strategic planning process, followed by a session on our standard setting agenda process. So all of us on the board, strongly encourage you to ask questions and comments throughout the meeting raise your hand uh, with your uh, you know on, on, we have the raise your hand function uh, in in webex so use that we'll be monitoring the chat box uh, we're all sort of accustomed to a virtual environment so uh, although webex is a little bit different for some folks so we'll be uh, you know trying to help just uh, send a question to people on the staff and we'll try to help you if you have any issues. And for the record, I'm gonna do the standard disclaimer for all of the board members and the staff that are speaking today. The views expressed by each of the presenters today are their own views and do not necessarily reflect the views of the board or other board members or the staff. So now I'm pleased to turn over the microphone to, well, let's start with our administrative overview organization uh, and process um, agenda item. So that's our first agenda item. I'm gonna turn over the mic to Ken Lynch, who leads our Office of General Counsel. He's gonna be our first presenter. Ken? Thank you very much. And I think there's a PowerPoint that should be going up. Uh, yes, can it'll be in just a moment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome uh, and congratulations on your appointment to the PCAOB's new investor advisory group. I'm Kenneth Lynch, general counsel of the PCAOB, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the fine print, but I won't get into too much excruciating detail because the uh, Charter uh, is available to all of you, and I'm sure you've all taken a look at it, but I encourage you to 
uh, uh, go to that uh, as needed. The topics I'm going to cover today include uh, statutory authority for the PCOB advisory groups, uh, PCOB rule 3700, and the IAG charter. If we can move to slide two. Uh, under section 103 of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, the board shall convene advisory groups to make recommendations concerning auditing, quality control, ethics, independence, or other standards. Uh, and section 101 of the act empowers the board generally to perform such duties or functions as it determines necessary or appropriate to carry out its mission under the act. And the DC Nonprofit Act, uh, which is made applicable uh, to the board by Sarbanes-Oxley, specifies that a nonprofit corporation may create or authorize the creation of one or more advisory committees whose members need not be directors. And that there are certain limitations on, on those, but that's uh, where the authority comes from. Slide three, uh, PCOB rule 3700 governs the formation, composition, and role of advisory groups to assist the board in formulating new auditing and related professional practice standards for registered public accounting firms. Uh, PCOB rule 3700 also calls for certain ethical duties to apply to you all advisory group members. Slide four. So we're to uh, really the, the meat of it is, is the charter, the IAG charter, uh, which was adopted by the board along with the charter of the new standards and emerging issues advisory group, SEAG, uh, was done at an open meeting on March 29. It had, the charter has 18 sections addressing matters ranging from the IAG's function to the selection, qualification, and terms of service of members as information about uh, the particulars about meetings, including uh, like the one we're having here today. Uh, several key features of the IAG charter, uh, and as I mentioned, the charter is posted on the PCOB's website, uh, merit special emphasis at this inaugural meeting of the IAG. As I said earlier, please be sure to read and refer to the charter itself. And this briefing, uh, is not intended to be a comprehensive uh, uh, look at, at that charter, but more uh, an overview to walk you through what I think are some of the key provisions. Slide five, uh, sections one and three of the charter set forth the purpose and duties of the IAG, which are expressly tethered to the PCOB's investor protection mission. The uh, IAG's authority extend, extends to providing the board with the views of investors and their advocates on the board's regulatory agenda, including the following, uh, advising the board regarding matters related to the auditing profession of concern to investors, providing the board with investors' perspectives on current regulatory issues, and serving as a source of information, views, perspectives, and recommendations to the board on other matters regarding the PCOB's oversight activities from, again, the point of view of investors. Determinations of any actions to be taken by the PCOB and policy to be expressed within the board's authority on which the IAG provides advice shall be made solely by the board. Uh, and it's also worth noting that should the IAG not reach consensus, uh, it may choose to provide the board with differing or a range of opinions. Slide six. Uh, sections five, six, eight, and nine of the charter touch on certain ethics related issues. And uh, Beth Horton, the PCOB's ethics officer, uh, will address some of those matters with you. Uh, separately, but notably under section six of the charter, membership is personal to the individual selected to serve and members shall serve in their personal capacities, not as representatives of particular employers. And member duties and responsibilities, including attendance at 
the meetings may not be delegated uh, to others. The board has taken great care in constituting the IAG to adhere to the requirements of section six of the charter, which establishes the number and qualifications of IAG members. IAG members are divided into two cohorts with staggered terms to facilitate continuity. At the May 9th, 2022 press release announcing your appointment specifies when your membership term will expire. Please note that the board retains authority in its sole and absolute discretion to remove any IAG member at any time for any reason with or without cause. Uh, section six of the charter also expressly, also expressly states that to enhance communications between the IAG and the, and the CAG, the board shall seek to have at least one CAG member also serve on the A IAG. Here we have multiple uh, people, Jennifer Joe, Jeff Mahoney, Sandra Peters, and Lynn Turner have uh, each been appointed to both advisory groups. Slide seven, please. Sections 10 through 12 of the charter set forth certain parameters for leadership, setting of meeting agendas and meetings themselves. As you all know, the board has appointed board member Stein, uh, who shall not be an IAG member as the board appointed acting co-chair of the IAG. The IAG is tasked to appoint the other co-chair removable at the discretion of the IAG or the board from among its members. The IAG co-chairs are responsible for the IAG's carrying out of its meeting agendas. Those agendas shall be developed by the IAG co-chairs based on input from the board and IAG members. Slide eight, please. Section 12 of the charter calls for the activities and meetings of the IAG generally to be public, such that there should be no expectation of privacy in connection with your participation, which we anticipate will be recorded, made publicly available, and preserved for posterity. The IAG shall hold at least two public meetings per calendar year, but may hold additional ad hoc public or non-public IAG meetings. Unless otherwise directed by the IAG co-chairs in consultation with the board, Non-public meetings, including breakout or executive sessions, shall be closed to the public, but open to IAG members, observers, invited experts, board members, and PCOB staff. And for uh, purposes of quorum, a majority of IAG, IAG members shall constitute a quorum. Slide nine, please. A PCOB staff person designated by the board appointed IAG co-chair shall serve as secretary of each meeting and shall prepare minutes thereof. Uh, at today's meeting, Matt Golden uh, within my office, the Office of General Counsel, is serving uh, as secretary and will be preparing uh, minutes of this meeting. Non-public information as defined in EC9 of the PCOB Ethics Code may not be discussed at any public meeting of the IAG absent advanced board approval. The IAG charter contains provisions regarding the participation of experts and the attendance of observers at meetings. Section 15 of the IAG charter calls for the provision of at least two weeks notice for IAG meetings. Sections 16, and 17 of the charter set forth particulars regarding voting and the procedural uh, rules to apply during IAG meetings. Slide 10, please. Uh, subcommittees uh, comprised of IAG members only may be formed at the direction of the board or the IAG co-chairs when consideration of a particular matter would benefit from focused attention by a subset of the IAG's membership. The IAG co-chairs in consultation with the board and IAG members shall specify the topic to be investigated, 
unless otherwise specified, any subcommittee shall comprise those IAG members selected by the IAG. Uh, the other uh, matter here is the task forces, which may include non IAG members. And that is the principal difference between subcommittees and task forces. Task forces may include uh, people other than uh, members and may be formed at the direction of the board or the IAG co-chairs when consideration of a particular matter would benefit from the regular participation of individuals who are not IAG members. The IAG co-chairs in consultation with the board and IAG members shall specify the topic to be investigated and the nature of any non-IAG member perspectives that the IAG desires to include in the task force. The IAG may recommend to the board participants who are non-IAG members. Appointments to a task force of non-IAG member participants, if any, second, shall be subject to approval of the board in its sole and absolute discretion. Unless otherwise specified, any task force shall comprise all IAG members who wish to be involved in carrying out a task. So uh, thanks for your uh, attention to um, the small print here. Uh, th there's a lot more I could have gone into that I've, uh, I've purposely uh, not gotten to and uh, welcome any uh, questions that you might have. Okay, hearing no questions and seeing no hands raised. I see a hand, Jeff Mahoney. Yes, good morning. Um, my question relates to the task forces. Um, would the task forces include uh, PCOB staff assisting uh, the committee with administrative and other tasks that, that the, uh, uh, the group may assign? I, I believe that that would could be provided for uh, as we said the task force can um, have uh, personnel uh, outside of the the members as as a part of that um, I, I don't know if we've uh, worked out all the details on that but I, I think you can expect that um, the PCOB will provide the necessary support for those thank you Um, I have, wait one second here. Um, who is next, Kent? I think it is Beth Horton. No, 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 not uh, oh. Kent. Who had their hand raised? Uh, next? Here, I, I, I believe it was Jennifer Joe first, and then uh, Hale Schroeder. Okay, so Jennifer, uh, go ahead. Hi, um, I have a question with regards to those of us who are both members of the IAG and CI. Given that there is confidential information that shouldn't be communicated, but then we're also asked to liaison between the two advisory groups. Can you provide any specific guidance on what communication we're allowed to share with the CAG and what we're prohibited from sharing with the CAG? I think the, the key here is that, um, you know, in terms of the, the public meetings, that no such information can be shared. I, uh, I don't know if we ha uh, have worked out uh, all the protocols on that, but let me uh, take that offline and, and uh, revert back to you with um, that, how that will, will work. But the, the key thing here is, uh, I think communication between the different uh, advisory groups is is acceptable just not um, in a public uh, forum uh, such as today's. Thank you. Okay, and who, who was after that, Kent? Uh, that would be uh, Hal. Uh, Hal, okay. Hal, go ahead. Thanks, Carol. Uh, Ken, could you expand a little bit on uh, the, the slide where you talked about the uh, the group expressing its views and potential for opposing uh, views. Is there a format? Is there a process 
Um, to what extent will these uh, views be uh, codified, archived on the website? Could you just walk, it, walk us through that and give us a little bit more detail? Sure, and, and I mean, this, this, the, 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 the point of, of this, uh, of, of course, is in, in any group of uh, this number of people, uh, clearly there could be two, three, four, four different views uh, that are um, Im important and, and that the uh, advisory group may wish to communicate to the the board here. Uh, and, and so the board, uh, the IAG can only provide those, what I'll say, uh, other views to the extent that the IAG uh, votes uh, to to pass those along, so it it isn't um, automatically done. But um, assuming that the IAG votes to communicate those other views, then it would get um, those views would get passed along to the board in the same uh, manner as the uh, as the, all all the other views uh, together. I don't know if that uh, a answers your your question. And, and are these views public? How are they um, made public? Uh, they're, they're, I don't believe that they would be uh, public in the first instance. Uh, that would be uh, up uh, to the board as to whether to make make those uh, a matter of public record. Okay, and is there a process for the board uh, considering? Is there a vote? How would that work? I think it would be up up to the board. I, I don't know if we've worked through um, the, the details, but uh, any release of, of information to the public has to be approved by the board in some fashion. Sometimes it's formal, sure. sometimes it's less formal. So yes, it would be something that would that the uh, the entire board would need to consider and okay. and approve. Okay, maybe maybe at a subsequent meeting we can talk a little bit more in detail as to what that process is. So we're, we're all familiar with it. Yes. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. These are all great questions. Um, and clearly we have a new charter. One of the, I think, underlying expectations is that we will be able to hear from all of you and that differing views are okay sometimes. So that's the spirit of, of, how the charter was written, and we'll look forward to working through that with you um, as we go forward. So I see no more hands up on my screen for questions for Ken. I see one more, Lynn Turner. Thank you, Kara. Uh, I'd just like to say I share Hal's thoughts and, and questions. I know that with the old IAG, there were some presentations made that were put up on the PCAOB website, including with topics like uh, no CLAR and uh, going concerned that got a lot of attention. And I think we're very, uh, very helpful. So it would be great if we can continue to do that. Uh, the one thing I get a little bit concerned when I hear some of the comments has to do with transparency of the board. It's got a reputation of being a bastion of darkness. And I would hope that with the new board, it can move more towards a transparent information being provided to investors and others who the board serves. So I'd hope the board keeps it that in mind. Hello. And, and as Hal said, hopefully we can come back and have some more discussion about this at the next meeting. Thanks, Lynn, and, and, and thanks, Hal, too. Um, I agree, I think this uh, board is committed to transparency and, and just because there is a process uh, that we have to follow doesn't mean um, that it's not going to be. Uh, um, so I'm sorry, I don't know if it's my turn to talk. I can't hear anything. Um, can you hear me? We can, Beth. Can you hear me? 
No. Beth, can you hear me? Okay. So we will try to help you work through those problems, Beth. I don't know if Brian or Kent can help her. Yeah, yes, we'll, we'll work with her, Kara. Okay. Yeah, Lynn, thank you for that. I mean, I think this board wants to be the bastion of transparency. So we will work through uh, how to best do that uh, going forward. And we are supposed to be hearing from Beth Horton, who's our ethics officer, and it sounds like we're having some technical um, difficulty. So we'll wait one minute to see if we can work that out. Does anybody else have any further questions? Okay. Beth, can you hear me? I don't think she can hear me. So my inclination, if we can't get this up and running um, quickly. I'm so sorry, everyone. I, I can't hear, um, but I'm going to go ahead and go on with the presentation. The only problem I may have are questions. Um, as I, I'm not sure what's going on. I can't make the, I, I, I understand that you can hear me, but unfortunately I can't hear you. So I will go ahead and step through. Um, uh, my part of the presentation, and then if we if I can't get the um, the sound on my end to work, I'm happy to answer any questions um, at this as afternoon session. If that works, I will um, just start with uh, my part of the presentation. Um, good morning, everyone. Again, I'm sorry for the the technical difficulty. This morning, I will be briefing you on the rules of the road for our newly selected uh, members. Um, I will. I will briefly touch upon various articles in the IHA Charter that impose specific duties and responsibilities on our members, beginning with Article 3. Under Article 3, uh, if Ken has touched on some of these points, but I will just reiterate them briefly, um, you are expected to conduct your work with a view toward furthering the PCOB's mission always. You need not, as Ken mentioned, reach a consensus on every issue, and you may choose to provide the board with a differing or range of opinions on, on each issue. No member of, um, of, the, of the group may be closely related to an employee or board member or commissioner, as the case may be, of the PCEOB or the SEC. Although concurrent service on the IAG and one or more SEC advisory committees is permitted. There are a number of qualifications that are assigned to you as members. You must always exhibit the highest level of integrity and be mindful of the importance of the integrity of the board and its mission when carrying out your duties. You may be employed or otherwise affiliated with other organizations, but you must always act independently and not as a representative of any employer. Your duties and responsibilities, including attendance at meetings, may also not be delegated to others, as Ken also mentioned previously. Article 8 of the Charter imposes specific, specific ethical standards to you as members. I will go over several of these later this afternoon, um, but I will also touch upon them here. You must always act in the public interest in connection with your participation in the IAG. You must assist the board and staff in avoiding any actual or perceived conflicts of interest by refraining from improperly using your position to influence board members or board staff on matters directly affecting you or your employer, business partners, or clients. You must recuse or withdraw from the consideration of any matter that would directly affect you, your employer, business partners, or clients. And if recusal or withdrawal is not practical, you would be required to resign. It's important to note that any matter that affects your employer, your business partners, or your clients to the same degree as other similarly situated organizations or individuals, that does not constitute a direct effect, and so that would not require a recusal on your part. You must keep any information that has not been released, announced, or otherwise made publicly available by the PCAOB confidential. This is what Ken just touched on with regard to EC9, and we will talk about that a little bit more in depth this afternoon. You must include a disclaimer with any publication or public statement concerning your work for the PCAOB or the IAG, noting that the views expressed are your own and do not necessarily reflect the views 
of the board, its members or staff, the IAG or its members. You must devote an adequate amount of time to consideration of matters, including reading free, including free meeting materials uh, and regularly attending and actively participating at meetings. You must comply with Ethics Code Sections EC 3, 8, 9, and 10 or equivalent provisions in the event that the PCOB's Ethics Code is amended, as well as PCOB Rules 3700D and E. As you are already aware, you were required to execute an ethics agreement indicating your consent to be bound by those provisions and to certify compliance on an annual basis. You will continue, continue to be bound by the relevant ethics rules and ethics agreements once your terms have ended, specifically those um, related to the confidentiality of information. You will not receive any form of compensation for your service. Travel-related expenses incurred for your service may be reimbursed by PCAOB, subject to our travel and business expense policy. IAG meetings, um, while the activities and meetings will generally be public, non-public information, obviously we reiterate this quite a bit, may not be discussed at any public meeting without advanced board approval. Um, that, that ends my very brief uh, presentation for this morning's session. Um, there is time for, I believe, um, questions. And even though I can't hear, um, I do have actually someone on my phone that can text me the question. So if you do have one, you can raise your hand and I can either answer them now with a slight delay as she texts me the question, or um, we can uh, address your questions this afternoon. Again, I, I apologize that, that I can't hear you. Go ahead, Hal. And then Jennifer. I see a hand. Hal Schroeder. Okay. So I will. I'll keep my question short. Um, I will, will wait for the text. Will there be someone from your office attending the meetings that can make sure we, we steer away from any non public if we accidentally headed in that direction? I think the question is, will someone attend meetings to help make sure we steer away from discussing non-public information? Um, I am not, have not been made aware of who will be attending the meetings. Um, it's not my understanding that um, someone from uh, either myself or Michelle Lee will be attending the individual meetings, but I believe PCAOB board staff um, would be able to answer those questions during your meetings. Um, our staff is well versed in EC9, and I can also help you um, prior to any meeting. If you have any questions, you can always always reach out at any time um, to either myself or to Michelle Lee, and we can describe what you know what would be considered non-public and what you would need to veer away from. Really, it's anything to make it to make it a quick short answer of this. It's anything that has not been released to the public. This is a much greater um, or broader standard than what most people um, have an understanding of when it comes to confidentiality of information. You know, most people think of it as business confidential or if you've been in the government, you know, um, secret, top secret. This is uh, broader than that. It's anything that the board has not made available to the public. So a, a good rule of thumb for this type of, of issue is, if you have not seen this in the public domain at some point, then you should consider it non-public and ask the question if it can be released. Because it is something as simple as, um, you know, in our, in our own ethics training, I will tell people that if one of our board members happened to be attending a meeting, um, you know, uh, or, or speaking at an event, and we hadn't released that to the public, that would be covered by EC9, which seems, a, you know, a bit ridiculous, but that's the extent of the, of the provision. And so um, I, would, I would look at it through that lens. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Jennifer? Thank you, Beth, for your remarks. Um, I wanted some clarification. Are there any other questions? I don't see hands popping up. Yeah. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Uh -huh. So I'll, I'll show, show my hand visually as well. Um, so my question was related to our disclaimer 
Um, is there going to be standard language that will be circulated to the members of the advisory group on the language we should use when we know that our views that we're going to present are our own and not those of the board? That's one part of the question. And two, um, for those of us who are academics, we might be presenting papers, for example, for myself on audit research. And so are we going to be required at every academic presentation to make that disclosure? Just would like some clarification on that. I believe the question um, relates to uh, disclaimers. And yes, we can provide you language that you can use. Um, and for those of you that are academics, if you, it, it, it's dependent upon whether the information that you are, um, that, you know, is included in the writing is PCAOB specific or, you know, IAG specific. In those instances, you would be expected to use the disclaimer. It's very generic. It's, it's something, I believe even Kara started the meeting with one that is very similar. And it's just a statement that the views expressed therein um, are the author's views alone and do not re necessarily reflect the views of any employer. Or if you were writing specifically about a PCOB or an IAG matter, we may ask you to make it a little bit more specific that the views do not necessarily reflect the views of the board or of the IAG. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very, it's a short disclaimer. And again, it's only um, required in those instances where you are speaking specifically to PCOB related matters or IAG matters. So any other, you know, anything that's broader um, in scope that PCEOB would be included in, but you're not, you know, singling PCEOB out, um, and it's and it's not uh, the article is not um, uh, written with a specific, you know, PCEOB in mind. Just give us a call, and I will um, be happy to walk you through if you need a disclaimer or not. And, and we're happy to distribute disclaimer language, or at least a uh, an example for you. Thank you. Any other questions? And again, I'm, I'm happy to answer more of these this afternoon. We'll have a, a, a bit of time um, to answer questions again, and, and hopefully by that point, I will, I will have sound <laughs> and, um, and we'll not have to go through the, the texting, but I, I appreciate your patience and thank you for giving me time this morning. Thank you, Beth, for, for uh, despite technical difficulties, uh, continuing and being persistent. So our next agenda item is an overview of uh, three of the divisions at the PCOB's work. So we're going to give you an overview of the activity of the Division of Registration and Inspections, the Division of Enforcement and Investigations, and the Office of the Chief Auditor. This is uh, to provide you with some, some, especially for those who have not been part of the advisory group before, uh, to learn who some of the leaders of our organization are and some of the work that's being done. So we're gonna start with George um, Boddock. Um, George, go ahead. Um, and George is the head of our Division of Registration and Inspections. Great, thank you, uh, Kara, and, and, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be with everyone on this uh, opening meeting of the Investor Advisory Group. Um, what I'd like to do, as Kara just suggested, is provide a, a brief, I'll admit, overview of our Division of Registration and Inspections and some of the activities that, that we do. Um, it's, I'll say it's a fairly basic discussion, but happy to take any specific questions you might have um, later on. Um, but is trying to provide a broad baseline of the overall activities. So with that, why don't we maybe move to uh, the slides, Brown, you have a moment. Yep, George, they'll be up in just a moment. Okay, thank you, sorry. So in the, the next slide, uh, just to touch on the, the first part of the process for firms is the registration process. And firms that are registered with the PCAOB are the firms that we collectively have jurisdiction over. So this is the first entryway, if you will, for a firm um, into the PCOB system. So the registration process is voluntary. Um, firms don't have to, to, to register, but, and however, any firm um, that prepares, U.S. or non-U.S., prepares uh, an audit report on an issuer or a broker-dealer 
um, or plays a substantial role in one of those audits must be registered with the board. So it's voluntary, but there's a but that the firm has to be registered to issue an opinion on an issue or a broker dealer. And again, that is uh, uh, re irregardless of whether the firm is located in the United States or it's around the world. And as you can see in the composition of, of registered firms currently, we have about 1,700 firms that are registered with the PCOB. That number moves around a bit, as you can imagine, as firms may uh, seek to register, which happens, or firms may merge with other firms uh, or withdraw, as the case may be. Um, interestingly enough, of the 1,700, it's not exactly 50-50, but it is roughly 50-50 U.S., non-U.S., uh, relative to um, relative to um, where the firms are located. Um, and you can see um, on the slide, on the previous slide, about uh, 85 countries or jurisdictions are represented, represented of firms that are registered. And from an inspection perspective, which we'll jump to here in a second, um, we've inspected firms collectively in roughly 50 jurisdictions around the world. Um, as we've conducted our inspections internationally over the last decade um, or so. Um, and the last data point I'll mention on this slide, um, roughly 50%, um, using a very round number, 50% of the firms that are registered have an inspection requirement, um, meaning they've issued an opinion on an issuer or broker-dealer, or, or issuer in particular. Um, that number moves around as well. So not every single firm that's registered um, of the 1,700 have, have or has uh, an inspection requirement um, as, as we sit here. So with that, um, from a baseline of the registration uh, aspect, let's move to inspections. The next slide, please, Brian. Um, inspections, as you might guess, is where we spend the bulk of our time, both in terms of resources and just time um, overall conducting inspections um, around the world. Certainly, I'll say during the COVID years, it has been different than it was pre-COVID. And as we come out of COVID, hopefully um, things will begin to get uh, back more to norm normal in terms of in-person inspections. But simply put, as a baseline, um, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, as well as the PCOB rules, um, require a, a, a continuing program of inspections to assess the degree of compliance of each registered firm and associated person of that firm with the applicable laws, the rules, professional standards in the firm's quality system, as well as the audits that we inspect. So essentially, we're inspecting the firm's compliance with all the applicable rules and, and guidance um, by the PCOB, the SEC, uh, or the firm's own internal guidance, if you will. Um, the purpose of an inspection, simply put, is to accurately access, drive improvement in, and communicate audit quality, which will be through our inspection reports on a primary basis. Um, there is a frequency aspect to our inspections. Um, firms that issue over 100 opinions in a calendar year, so over 100 opinions are required to be inspected annually. We call those annual firms. And then firms that uh, issue 100 or fewer opinions are required to be inspected uh, at least once in a triannual cycle. Now, they could be inspected more frequently, um, but they require to be inspected at least once in a three-year cycle. And we call those firms triannually inspected firms as, 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 a, as a generic phrase, annual and triannual. Um, currently, all the annually inspected firms are U.S.-based. Um, we do not have any annually inspected firms outside the U.S., even though there's some very large firms, but they don't have a large number of U.S. issuers outside the U.S. Um, there are right now 14 um, annually inspected firms. That number definitely moves. Um, some firms move up or down below the below or above the 100. Um, and that could be through acquisition of issuers. It could be through mergers that firms have moved above, above the 100 threshold. So right now it's 14. And, and on a broad basis, we, we conduct roughly 200 uh, inspections a year. That includes issuers and brokers and dealers. Again, that number will shift based on the triennial cycle in the U.S. and outside the U.S. Um, but that's kind of roughly in terms of where the bulk of our resources within the division, our focus is on our actual inspections. Uh, again, whether it's U.S. or non-U.S., annual or triennial. Um, as part of the inspection, just one particular point, the board and the staff, uh, our expectations, the firms will make available the, the, the firm personnel, whether it's QC related or it's engagement specific, as well as all the firm's work papers or other relevant information to support uh, the firm's audit. 
on the next slide, we'll go a little deeper into the elements of an inspection. So you might say, well, gosh, what is an inspection and does it vary? Well, there are two components that are consistent across all of our inspections, whether it's a US big four firm or it's a small firm with maybe two partners and one, one issuer. Um, and each, each firm inspection will include a review of the firm's system of quality control, as well as a selection of individual audits to inspect. Now, as you might suspect, that will vary dramatically from, again, a U.S. big four type firm versus a smaller, um, not just a sole practitioner, but even a smaller firm um, in the U.S. or even outside the U.S. So our approach is scaled, um, particularly in the area of QC. Um, the firm's uh, sophistication, um, extent of its audits will drive the firm's system of quality control, um, and our, we will tailor our inspection procedures based on the, the, that level of, of size, complexity, sophistication to some extent of the firm. So we are very scalable from a review of the QC system. And then from an, a file selection process, um, that will vary obviously as well. At a U.S. Big Four firm, well, the numbers vary a little bit. We're looking at probably somewhere 50 to 55 files. Um, and obviously, in a smaller firm, that number will come down um, commensurate with the size of the firm's um, issue or practice. When we make our file selections, uh, we do have a risk-based and a random aspect to it, particularly at the, at the larger firms. Um, risk-based is our is our primary selection as it's been over the years. The the amount of random selections that we make. Um, has varied over the years, um, but and it does vary based on the size and complexity of the firm's um, overall audit practice. From a QC perspective, a quality control perspective, things that we're looking out looking at there will include items such as um, independence and how the firm approaches independence, um, client acceptance, continuous procedures, partner compensation. Um, method, uh, firm methodology for audit, for accounting matters, their training, that they, they how they educate and keep their staff current. Um, we'll look at their internal uh, inspection or internal review program, their monitoring of that, um, how they make their, their corrections or adjustments based on those deficiencies that they might identify through that process as well. And those are just a few that the items that, that, that we spend time on. There are other items that we also look at as part of our system of review, the system of quality control. The output of the inspection process is the inspection report. But before we get to the inspection report, um, if we do identify, our inspectors identify deficiencies or findings, if you will, either in the QC area or more particularly in the audits that we review, we will communicate those deficiencies through a process that, that we call the comment form process. So we have a standard document, essentially, what we call the comment form, which will summarize the issue that we've identified. It'll provide background, and then it will allow the firm the opportunity to respond to the comment form and either say they agree or disagree. If they disagree, here's the reasons uh, that they disagree. Uh, that response is not, not required. It's certainly um, something that we encourage firms to do to provide their perspectives, their views on our observations. And most firms do respond to the comment form, whether they agree or disagree. And then we'll also ask firms as part of that, um, what remedial actions are they going to take to address the, the, um, the observation that we've identified or we believe that we've identified in terms of noncompliance. So the comment form will, will kind of start the, the process going through and up to the inspection report. So, Brian, if we can go to the next slide, please. So the next couple slides want to provide just a broad overview of our inspection reports. Again, this is the output of the process that ultimately goes to the board um, from the staff for the board's review and, and approval or comment. The, the inspection reports for the annually inspected firms have an executive summary. And this, this version of the report template, I'll call it, uh, is new a couple years ago. We spent a lot of time a few years ago to come up with uh, and revamp and, and uh, revise our inspection report um, to not just try to streamline it, line it and make it a bit more user friendly, but also to provide other data points, um, trend lines, um, and some graphs that we think makes it more informative and more useful um, to investors and other stakeholders that are looking at our, our, our reports. Um, so the annual reports I mentioned have an executive summary. Um, we do focus, obviously, on the current year inspection activities and results. Uh, with that, we do provide um, the prior two years, if it's applicable, of inspection history. So a re reviewer and a reader of one year's report 
um, can see is the firm improving our comments up comments down what we've looked at um, through those those prior years to give some broader context to what what it all might mean as, as one looks at an, an inspection report the the inspection reports i'll quickly say have two key parts to them what we would refer to as part one and then part two part one is what's public uh, on our website uh, which which by and large relates to the underlying audit deficiencies for the, the file selections and then part two reflects uh, observations we may have in the firm's system of quality control which the firm has the ability to remediate um, to the board's satisfaction and they would not become public so there are two key parts to our our reports and again that's applicable to all firms that we inspect and issue reports broker dealer programs are a little bit different i'll touch on that uh, here in a few moments um, Brian, if you go to the next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, the part one, the part two are the two main parts of our reports. Um, part one of our report in the current format has a part one A and a part one B. Part one B was new a few years ago, which I personally was very excited about because I think it, it provides additional transparency and perspectives to the public that didn't exist previously. Part 1A, which I'll call the primary part, if you will, because this has been consistent over the years. Part 1A are deficiencies that we believe rise to the level such that the firm, at the time it issued its opinion, did not obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence to support the opinion, um, as well as uh, potentially the, inter the ICFR, internal controls over financial reporting. So that would say the firm um, conceptually should not uh, have issued its opinion when it did because their work was not performed or sufficiently performed. That's part 1A. And in the version of the report, we do have categor categorization, a categorized um, uh, part 1A findings into three different categories to try to give some, again, further context perspective. Part 1B are items that are not part 1A, but they relate to instances of non-compliance with PCOB standards or rules. Things that are commonly in Part 1B are CAM, critical audit matter observations, maybe communications to the audit committee that should have occurred. Things like that are Part 1B. Um, and as I mentioned, Part 2 of our inspection report relates to quality control. These are items that are criticisms or potential defects in the firm's system of quality control. Um, and again, they would not be made public until um, after the firm has had an opportunity to remediate those observations. Uh, part one three, I'm sorry, part three, excuse me, part three, which is only in triannual firm reports, which is also non-public, that relates to other matters. Independence items may pop up in part one three is one example. Um, and then appendix A is where the firm has the opportunity to respond uh, to the draft inspection report. So the staff will provide the firm what we call a draft report uh, for them to review and then to provide the comment. Um, and they can have a public comment as well as a non-public response um, as well. And then on the next slide, just, just quickly in terms of our process. Um, Brian, if we could, thank you. Um, our process to issue the final report. So after the draft has been submitted to the firm, the firm has 30 days to respond to the draft report if it so chooses. Uh, the staff, we will review the firm's draft report very, very carefully, their response. Um, if they have a response where they, they disagree, we'll go through a very thorough review, we, we like to think, at a staff level. Um, that may involve discussions with our chief auditor. Um, it will definitely involve discussions with our Office of General Counsel um, to make sure we are all still comfortable with the observations in the report. Once that's happened, the report will be made available for the board for their review and consideration for approval. Um, Assuming the board approves the report, um, they may have questions, but assuming the board approves the report, then the final report will be issued to the firm. Um, copies of the final report will go to a number of, of other parties. These may include um, a non-US regulators to the extent we have protocol agreements, and this will be the full report, public and non-public. The SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, will receive the full report, um, as well as state regulatory authorities uh, where the firm is is located and licensed domestically would also receive the full report. Now, once the full report is issued, the next phase of the inspection process is remediation, and and that triggers the the 12 months where the firm has 12 months to review and remediate the firm's um, qu quality control um, observations that are included in part uh, two of the report. 
And as you can see on, on this slide, as I mentioned, there's a 12 month period. Um, our staff that, that are focused on remediation will engage with the firms. We're, we're certainly um, encouraging firms to respond um, as, as timely as they can, not wait to month 11 um, to give us a submission, but to engage ideally within the first 30 or 60 days with the staff as they're thinking about the firm is thinking about what the root causes are, uh, thinking about what remedial actions the firm is taking, whether it's training, methodology, um, new programs they may be putting in place or new initiatives to, to try to remediate and prevent the, the observations from occurring in the future. Um, we will interact with the firm extensively dur during that, that period. Um, the, the guidance that the board has and staff have, have published around remediation to try to give some color to what the process is are really two documents um, of substance. One is in 2006, the board uh, issued uh, information around, around the remediation process. And then in 2013, the staff provided guidance and criteria in terms of how we think about remediation, thinking about the firm's remedial actions and whether they're substantive, whether they're material changes, the relevancy, how we think about the design of the, the, the activities, the initiatives, um, how it was implemented and how it was executed and, and the overall effectiveness. So we have five criteria that we've articulated in the 2013 guidance, again, to give some context as firms think about remediation. Um, one item to mention uh, quickly related to both the report as well as remediation is the firm does have the ability to appeal board decisions um, to the SEC. There's a process the SEC goes through. There's a 30 day process. If, the, if a firm wants to appeal a final report, they can do that. And if they want to appeal a board determination, a negative determination or remediation, a firm can also do that. So we will, we will by and large wait for 30 days before a report is published on our website for the appeals process uh, to be known, as well as for any remediation determinations um, before the part two will be exposed on our website to ensure that the firm is not appealing uh, those, um, those board actions. To shift gears just, just slightly from our process, on the next slide, wanted to highlight a few of our common inspection um, deficiencies over the years. Um, and these deficiencies on the slide are fairly consistent, whether it's a U.S. firm, whether it's a non-U.S. firm, a large firm, or a small firm. Conceptually, these are the areas that are, are fairly consistent, the business combinations, um, you kind of M&A activity, if you will, uh, inventory, a uh, revenue, revenue recognition, uh, internal control or financial reporting, ICFR, allowance for loan losses, um, and then independence. And when, when one takes a, a step back and looks at these, um, independence is a little different, but the others, generally speaking, these topics involve uh, complex uh, areas, complex judgments, um, use of estimates, so very challenging areas, typically for the auditor to, 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 to audit and to focus on. So that is where we do have our findings. Um, again, it's fairly consistent over, over recent years, as well as um, uh, the size, size, nature, and location of the firms that doesn't seem to, to drive a different, a different answer. And then the, the last um, slide to touch on is the broker-dealer uh, program and broker-dealer inspections. This is our newest program. Um, this uh, came out of the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, where the board was provided oversight of auditors of brokers and dealers that are registered with the SEC. So we have registration, inspection, standard setting, and enforcement or disciplinary authority over auditors of brokers and dealers. Um, we started our inspections in 2011. Uh, we called an inter interim program. Um, it's still an interim program, so it's a little bit different from our issuer program. We do not have individual inspection reports on individual firms at this point. Um, we do uh, every year have an annual report, a summary level report on our broker dealer inspections. Uh, we call it a 4020 T report. Um, that will be issued in August, and this coming August will be the next um, version of that, a uh, focus on the prior year inspections. Um, again, it is an inter interim program. Um, a permanent program of broker-dealer um, broker inspections could change what we, what we do historically in terms of individual reports or classifications of brokers and dealers, and we, so we think about caring and clearing and the other, other aspects of, of that program. Um, so, so with that, uh, let me pause um, and happy to take any questions um, anyone may have. Thank you.
think Hal has a question. And then, then. Thanks, George. Uh, back to your slide nine. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the common deficiencies observation, and those are all summarized from the inspection reports. And if I recall correctly, you all do, I'm going to call it an annual report, a nice PDF. It's on the website. If, if my fellow IAG members have not seen that, I highly encourage them to use it. It's a great document. Um, I've used it in classes this past semester, uh, and the students found it incredibly informative. So, you know, that's, that's a little bit of advertisement for you guys. But my question to you, George, is with those deficiencies and the fact that they're relatively recurring over the years and you show the last three years in the most current report, how do you see the IAG helping you in that process? Is it more that to, you know, how, do, how does that, how do those deficiencies get communicated to investors? Because I can assure you, the investors I've worked with and the analysts in particular have no idea as to the level and the types of deficiencies, the things that they should be looking for. But what do you see getting from the IAG as it relates to these deficiencies in particular? Yes, th thank you, Howard, for the question. Let me let me take a stab at that, and certainly, um, Board Member Stein or others, feel free to, to chime in. I think what will be helpful, I'll just say at a staff level and helpful for the division, if I'll say first, if there's perspectives on our inspection reports, that is our primary way to communicate um, not just to the firms, but to the to the world, essentially what we're seeing from our inspection process. And obviously, the timeliness of those reports is something that we continue to focus on very much. But if there's if there's specific aspects either of transparency or usefulness of the reports. Um, you know, we do have some some guardrails, the part one, part two that are, that are pretty strong, but but within that, there's things we can think about. So there's ways to make it more useful for yourself, how your, your students or from other investors would love to hear that um, other information or ways to present things. Um, and I think the other aspect, and I'll, I'll pause, is, is the is a is the, your, your advertisement, as you call it, our, we call our preview document. Um, if there's ways to help with the spotlight document that will be useful to investors or others would love to hear that as well so i, I pause there and and um again board member stein if you have other thoughts mm -hmm. i mean how i mean that's how one of the reasons we have the investor advisory group is for you to tell us how we might make those more useful right so this is an iterative process and i think you've hit right on you know one of the issues which is how can we make sure that we are helping investors, audit committees, you know, the type of people you advise understand what type of questions they should be, you know, answer, you know, asking about the audit. And I had a question. Oh, go ahead, Al. I was going to say to, to that point, one, one comment, an analyst that worked for me for years, he made the point of saying, you know, these financial statements are accurate. The auditors have signed off. I think there's just a real level of a lack of understanding of what financial statements actually represent to what degree they can be relied on. So to any extent that we can talk about this in subsequent IAG meetings, I think it'd be helpful to um, educating the broader population and maybe we can talk about how to better educate them in terms of what audits do and don't do. I think that's a great idea. Um, I saw a question pretty early from David Pitt Watson in the chat box. So I am going to go ahead and read that one out. George, to what extent do the firms accept the inspection process as measuring a quote, good, unquote, audit? And to what extent are the criteria used by the PCOB predictable for auditors and therefore they are able to meet before the uh, inspection? Thanks for the question, two questions. I think one that makes take them in order. <coughs> Pardon me. On the first question, in terms of how do auditors react, it, it varies. Um, there are certain firms um, that are very accepting, may accept or agree, so to speak, to our observations. Other firms, um, um, not so much. Now, I will say very quickly, um, we we welcome disagreements. If if folks think we've got it wrong, our inspectors have got it wrong, or not not considering all the facts, you know, we certainly view that as a very healthy back and forth to make sure we get the right answer, if you will, and we consider everything. Um, but but the overall, it, it it firms do respond in different ways. Um, in terms of your second point, um, my, I guess my gut reaction would be 
you know, we try through, you know, various public speaking events, through the, the preview document, the summary documents that was mentioned to provide as much information in terms of what we're seeing. Um, one of the things that we, have, we started doing is good practices to help firms, if firms, particularly the smaller firms, if they're not sure how to do something or address something, if we're seeing, again, quote, a good practice, very judgmental, I'll admit, not a best practice, but a good practice, we think that is helpful um, for firms to see that if they're not aware of what other firms are doing in a broad sense to help them improve their audit quality. So we try to be, I'll say, as, as helpful, if you will, as we can as a regulator to, to drive and improve overall audit quality across all firms. Thank you, George. I'm going to go quickly in order, I think, if I got this right. Lynn, Jeff, and Jack. So, Lynn, go ahead. You're on mute. <laughs> Morning, George. Back to your page nine. Um, on these deficiencies, I looked at them and then compared them back to your the the board's new agenda and really don't see any of these common deficiencies on the board's agenda and uh, especially independence. And my question is, are these common deficiencies, in your opinion, a performance deficiency or a deficiency in a standard? And then I got a question for you about transparency, but that's the first question. Uh, I, I'm happy to happy to jump in and give give my perspective on it. Um, I, I think, Lynn, I'll, I'll say this in a, in a broad statement. Our, our observations we typically see um, probably fall more closely aligned with an execution issue as opposed to there's a clear deficiency in a standard. Um, and it's it's how the auditor's applying that that um, auditing standard relative to the set of facts in a very maybe a very complex area, very judgmental area. Are they utilizing professional skepticism is something that we do see and kind of question, are they considering all the facts? relative to you know qualitative components of an allowance for loan loss or other estimates so I, I would say broad brush they tend to fall more in that category not exclusively i will admit but tend to fall more in that category on the execution side as opposed to where one would say aha this needs to be fixed now having said that i can think of instances in other areas and some areas on this list that, that we could say that um, and think about, well, gosh, if the standard were tweaked a little bit left or right or up or down, it will be more clear, not just for the auditors, but for other, you know, you know, use the financial statements, what the auditor did. But by and large, I think it falls more closely in the, um, the execution phase. Would that include with respect to independence? Well, I think... Well, <laughs> Uh, my two cents on, on the independence, I, I think there is a, there is an aspect of, of 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 just compliance with the current standards, but I think there's probably other ways more, and I'll, I'll defer here to others at the board on this point about uh, ways to you know heighten or increase the requirements around independence that that might drive different issues, if you will, and 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 maybe maybe quality around the audit. I, I, in deferring to the board, Lynn, we're uh, open to your best ideas, right, on how to improve things going forward. I will also note that the ethics and independent standards are on the midterm agenda. <laughs> Which is excellent, Erica. Thank you. George, just one last question then on transparency. You mentioned at the beginning that uh, your inspection reports can be useful for uh, investors. The one uh, concern that has been expressed, though, time and time again for many years is that the inspection reports are only useful if you know the name of the company that's being inspected. Otherwise, eh, it's not useful at all. And investors just don't invest more 
portfolio managers don't have time to run around trying to figure out which company it is. Uh, they're already busy people already. Is consideration, have you considered how to make that more transparent so the information actually becomes useful to investors given the charge in SOX is to protect investors and yet it's not really doing it unless you give them the name of those companies. And while SOX prohibits disclosure on enforcement actions, it clearly doesn't uh, do that on inspections other than the part two. I think, Lynn, just, just to take a first uh, crack at your question, certainly appreciate the question, understand the question, and I think we've all heard it for a number of years, as you just articulated. Um, and I think we, we are thinking um, many ways to increase transparency, as, as Board Member Stein has mentioned, around our reports. Not to say anything's been decided, and I'll, again, I'll defer to the Board as well on, on that point, but it is something certainly that we have, we have thought about for the very reasons you've mentioned. Thanks, George. So I saw Jeff took his hand down. Jack, you go, and then we'll move on to our next presentation. Uh, thank you, Kara. George, just to follow on to uh, what Hal was talking about, ways to improve the, uh, the usefulness of the uh, inspection reports. As it is now, the, the firms, I think, uh, have always been very, um, I guess, uh, resistant to the findings on the inspection reports because they're basically negative. You had so many deficiencies and you make us look really bad, but you know we still give an opinion that passes muster. Um, and there's just not much color in there for investors as far as the inspections go, aside from what Lynn was saying about the name of the companies being inspected. But you mentioned that you know the purpose of an inspection is to accurately assess, drive improvement in, and communicate audit quality. Uh, I think that it would help investors if we had a device like audit quality indicators or key performance indicators at the firm and at the audit inspection level that could be communicated to investors that would give them a feel for how well the company is and how well the auditor is doing the job, aside from just a pass-fail kind of signal that they get from deficiencies up or deficiencies down or a large quantity of deficiencies. We don't get color on the inspections uh, quite the way we would if we had some audit quality indicators. And I, I really think that that's something that would also promote transparency on the part of the PCAOB how well the PCAOB is doing the inspections. Not that we don't think that they are doing them well, but this communicates more how the job would be done. So I would hope that going forward, the, the board really gives serious consideration, not just a research project, but a good home on the agenda to promote and devise audit quality indicators or key performance indicators, whatever name you want to give them. But there's more there than just pass fail, I think. So, uh, that, uh, Jack, that also sounds like a place where the advisory group could be helpful to us. So we look forward to interacting with you on that. I am now going to turn it over to our next presenter. Let me go back here to Bill. Bill, you're up next. Up next. Go ahead and put up. Thank you, Kara. Uh, good morning, members of the Investor Advisory Group. Uh, I'm delighted to be talking for a few minutes today about PCOB enforcement and investigations. I want to cover four general topics today and then leave time for any questions you may have. First, I want to talk about the board's enforcement jurisdiction and uh, the Division of Enforcement's mission. Second, I want to talk about the sources of our investigation and the matters we prioritize. Third, I'll talk about our processes for conducting our investigations and any resulting litigation, as well as the sanctions the board can impose. And I'll end by talking about our coordination with other regulators. So turning force first to our jurisdiction, uh, with respect to the board's enforcement jurisdiction in connection with the audits of issuers and of broker dealers that are registered with the SEC, the board can investigate violations of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. It can investigate violations of the board's own rules. It can investigate and 
sanction auditors for violations of the securities laws related to the conduct of audits, and it can also investigate and sanction for violations of PCAOB standards, which include auditing standards, quality control standards, as well as ethics and independent standards. The board exercises its enforcement authority through the Division of Enforcement and Investigations, which is made up of a staff of about 60 professionals, including attorneys, accountants, paralegals, and support staff. And in DEI, we both investigate potential violations, and if necessary, we conduct litigation before the board's hearing officer. And if there's an appeal from a hearing officer's decision, we litigate that before the board as well. If we could go to the next slide, Jay. This slide talks about the Division of Enforcement and Investigations mission, and our mission is straightforward. It's to protect investors, advance accountability, and deter improper conduct. And we strive to do that in both our investigations and litigation by focusing on serious violations and by proceeding with our investigations and our litigation as promptly and as efficiently as possible. We can move to the next slide, Jay. This slide talks about uh, the sources of our uh, investigations and our two primary sources are our referrals from our colleagues in the Division of Inspections and the work of our public source analysis team within the Division of Enforcement and Investigations. With respect to inspections, DEI meets with DRI, our inspection colleagues regularly, to discuss audits that might warrant investigation based on what DRI has found in its inspections of both global network firms and non-affiliate firms. The other primary source of our investigations, as I mentioned, is our public source analysis team. That team is composed of several DEI staffers who are dedicated to reviewing SEC filings, news reports, and other sources to identify audits that raise potential concerns. We also run the, D, uh, the board's TIPS program. Uh, we process and review all tips that the board receives. We've opened numerous investigations based on these tips. A lot of tips we get, however, are not within the board's jurisdiction. And when that happens, we refer those tips to other relevant regulators. Finally, with respect to the sources of our investigations, we receive tips, external referrals from other regulators, primarily the SEC with respect to issuer audits and FINRA with respect to the audits of brokers and dealers. We can move to the next slide, Jay. Uh, when determining whether to open an investigation and how we're gonna allocate our resources within DEI, we prioritize certain matters. Um, and those matters that we prioritize are the ones that present the greatest risk to investors and in our view are most likely to deter improper conduct. Our priority categories fall into three buckets. First, significant audit violations, which is really the bread and butter of our investigations that we do within DEI. Second, potential auditor independence violations. And third, what we refer to as interference with the board's oversight processes. This latter category most commonly involves situations in which auditors, um, they, alter work papers in advance of inspections or in connection with a PCAOB investigation. Unfortunately, the board has seen this conduct uh, time and again. Uh, it's very first enforcement order related to improper alteration of work papers and interference with one of our inspections, and we continue to see this today. So those are our priority categories. Starting with this slide and the next few slides, uh, I'd like to discuss our processes for conducting our investigations. Our investigative portfolio within DEI consists of both informal inquiries and formal investigations. Essentially, all matters start as informal inquiries. If there is a recommendation to the director of DEI, my boss, to open up an investigation and he approves, we'll open up an informal inquiry. inquiry. Once an inquiry is opened, uh, we will assign a team, usually consisting of an attorney and an, account and an accountant, and this team will send out document and information requests to the auditor, whether that be a firm or individual. During this stage, we can't compel the production of documents or information. 
but firms and auditors typically comply and they produce the information that we're requesting. Once we get that information, the investigative team will review it and analyze it and make a determination as to how to recommend how to proceed. And there are three potential courses of action. If based on the work papers and other documents, there appears to be evidence of a significant violation, the team may recommend that we seek an order of formal investigation from the board, and in which case, if the board issues that order, we'll continue the investigation. Another potential avenue at this point is to, for the team to gauge whether the relevant individual or firm is interested in settling the matter if we believe that there is a significant violation at this informal stage. If so, and we think the settlement terms being offered are acceptable, we'll recommend that the board issue a settled disciplinary order, which will result in a public order that's put on our website that describes the misconduct and the sanctions. Finally, the third alternative at this stage, if there doesn't appear to be a significant violation, the investigative team will recommend closing the matter. We can go to the next slide. So this slide talks about the first alternative I mentioned, which is if the team sees a, potential, a potentially significant violation and recommends that the board issue an order of formal investigation and the board agrees and issues that order, we will then within DEI have the authority to compel the production of documents and information and also to compel testimony from the relevant firm or the individual auditor. And so we will typically do that. We'll both issue what we call accounting board demands that demand additional documents and information, and we'll take testimony from the individuals with the relevant information. After collecting that additional evidence, we'll be at a decision point again. And at that point, we will again determine whether to proceed with the investigation or not. If we do, the matter can go one or two routes. If we recommend that the board issue uh, a settled disciplinary, well, let me let me back up. Uh, the two routes are the individual or firm can offer to settle the matter. At which point, if we believe that the that the sanctions are acceptable, we will make a recommendation to the board to issue a settled disciplinary order. Alternatively, the individual or firm. If we believe that um, there has been a serious violation and we think there should be charges against the individual or firm and the firm does not wish to settle, then we would go into litigation if the board agrees. Finally, another alternative is if we assess the evidence and do not believe, having collected that additional evidence, that there is a significant violation, we can recommend closing the matter. We can go to the next slide, Jay, please. So if we recommend a settled or litigated disciplinary order, the sanctions available are provided in both the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the board's rules, and there are an array of potential sanctions. Potential sanctions range from the most serious sanctions, which are heightened civil money penalties against a firm or individual, registration revocations for firms, and suspensions or bars for individual auditors. There are also lesser sanctions, including censures and requiring continuing professional education of auditors. Aside from censures, the sanctions that the board has imposed most often are civil money penalties. To date, the board has imposed more than 200 civil money penalties on firms and individuals. The board has also revoked the registration of more than 100 firms and has barred approximately 200 auditors from further association with registered firms. Some of the re revocations and bars that the board imposes are permanent. Others allow the firm to either re-register or allow the individual to petition to reassociate after a period of years. We can go to the next slide. One thing with respect to sanctions I wanted to note is that cer certain sanctions can only be imposed if the board finds that the firm or individual has engaged in intentional, knowing, or reckless misconduct or multiple instances of negligent conduct. The sanctions requiring those sorts of findings are registration revocations, bars, suspensions, 
limitations on activities and heightened civil money penalties. And we can see the heightened civil money penalties on this slide. For individuals, the maximum heightened civil money penalty is approximately 1.1 million per violation. And for, for firms, the heightened civil money penalty maximum is approximately 23 million per violation. So the last subject, excuse me, um, before turning to the last subject of coordination, I want to talk about the disciplinary, uh, uh, the contested disciplinary matters uh, that I mentioned earlier. If an individual chooses not to settle, but DEI is recommending disciplinary action against them, uh, the board can order a contested disciplinary hearing to be conducted before the board's hearing officer. At such a hearing, both DEI and the respondent present evidence in the form of work papers, other documentation, and also oral testimony. Oftentimes, if it's a potential audit failure case, the testimony is supported or includes the testimony of an expert put on by usually both the respondent and by DEI. After the um, evidence is presented to the hearing officer, the hearing officer will issue uh, an initial decision. And that decision can either be for the respondent or against the respondent and impose sanctions. Both DEI and the respondent can appeal the hearing officer's initial decision to the board. And also the board can review on its own the hearing officer's initial decision. If there is an appeal to the board, uh, the board will ultimately issue a final decision and if the decision is against the respondent audit firm or individual, the audit firm or individual can appeal to the SEC and then on to uh, a federal appellate court. One thing to note is that unlike the disciplinary hearings of many other regulators, our contested disciplinary proceedings are non-public while they're pending at the PCAOB. We can move to the next slide. I'll just talk briefly about our coordination with other regulators. Although both our investigations and our contested disciplinary proceedings are confidential, the board can and does share documents and information with certain other authorities identified in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, most notably the SEC, but also we can share with DOJ, DOJ and as appropriate with several of the banking regulators and with FINRA with respect to the audits of brokers and dealers. We also coordinate all of our investigations very closely with the SEC. And when it comes to our investigations of brokers and dealers, we also coordinate closely with FINRA. Finally, if the board has a cooperative arrangement in place with a non-US uh, regulatory oversight body for auditors, we will coordinate our investigations with that regulator when we're investigating firms within that regulator's jurisdiction. And if we can go to the last slide, I'll just end today by mentioning a couple of DEI highlights and what to look for going forward. First, uh, last year the board issued 21 settled disciplinary orders. And based on our current investigative pipeline, we expect to exceed that number of settled disciplinary orders this year. And as Chair Williams mentioned, has mentioned publicly, the board is focused on increasing the determinant deterrent effects of sanctions. DEI is certainly committed to that and particularly to increasing civil money penalties. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Al has a question, um, then Jeff, then Jennifer Joe. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about the linkage. This is going back to uh, the comments earlier about not knowing what individual companies were inspected the deficiencies. But when an individual auditor goes through the process, at some point that name becomes public if they found they've done something correct or, or wrong. Is that correct? That's correct. If uh, that's that's almost always correct. So if there is a settled order where the auditor agrees to the sanctions, there will be a public disciplinary order that the board puts on its website and under the current approach in those orders we not only name the individual respondent 
but in cases of audit failures and in cases of independence violations, we also name the company. Now that's DEI's recommendation. Ultimately, it's up to the board to determine whether to name the company in the order, but that do, is do the current approach. Of, do you have a sense of how often the name is mentioned without the company? So typically, uh, so it, it's a longer answer. Um, so historically, the board has tended to name the issuer in settled disciplinary orders in matters involving audit failures and independence violations. The situation uh, is different if it's a non-cooperation case where there's no not necessarily any evidence that there was a problem with the audit, but there may have been a problem with the auditor altering the work papers after the fact. In those situations, the board has tended not to name the issuer. Now that's historically. Uh, in the last three or four years, the board took a different approach and would only name the issuer when the uh, when the situation was that the issuer's name was essentially out there publicly already with respect to uh, the situation at issue with the auditor. So, for example, if there had been a restatement or the SEC had brought a case against the issuer. So the pendulum swung back to traditionally from the traditional approach to not naming the issuer as often. Now we have moved in the other direction and have, and have gone back to the traditional approach. But as I said, it's ultimately the board's decision. What I, what I would be curious about is to, if you monitor the chat rooms, if, if you name a person without naming the, the issuer, the, comp the specific company, do people try to find out what company that was involved as well as other companies that individual may have been involved in other audits of other public companies. I've always been curious as to what extent this information is used and to what extent would investors go to tracking down um, companies that could have, uh, you know, problematic audits and, and financial statements. So personally, I don't have the information about how often investors do that. We have seen from time to time reporters will discuss our cases in which we have not named the issuer and because they can see the date the audit report was issued, the date the financial statements were filed with the SEC, they may figure out very easily the issuer, but have not monitored the chat room. So I, I, I don't have insight into that. Others on, uh, from the- yeah, It may be worth kind of, because if, if it's important enough, people will eventually get it and that may inform us in terms of actions that the board could take in, in the future if people are really striving to get the information that may suggest the board go one direction versus another so no, thank you sure so who was next robert you had an order okay i'm going to make it up jennifer joe hi That's, I was sorry, jennifer joe hi um, I was wondering if you could provide some more information on us to us on the composition of the four sources that you, um, you know, disclosed to us that are sources for your investigation. For example, what proportion comes from tips versus your analyses versus um, in investigation from other agencies? And then are there some sources that are more fruitful in yielding matters that require significant attention? or further disciplinary action? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I think, as I mentioned, the primary sources for us are referrals from our inspections group and the analysis our PSA, our public uh, source analysis team does. So I would say that's probably about 85% uh, of our cases are sourced from those two sources. Um, and it's roughly split, I would say, between inspections and uh, the work done by our public source analysis team. Um, inspections of smaller firms, I will say, um, when we open those cases, those cases because, um, uh, well, I, I would say actually all cases, both inspections of smaller firms and inspections of GNF firms, because uh, our, our inspections group has already typically found that there are issues with those audits, 
those audits tend to be the ones that produce the best results for uh, our enforcement group. So I have a quick question for the group. We're sort of over time. Um, I am fine with us going to about uh, 1215, which will give you half an hour for lunch. Um, and then we regroup uh, if that's okay with everyone. And then we can take, uh, great, a couple more questions here and then start our last uh, presentation. Um, we'll be able to interact with Barb Banich in a later in the day presentation. So we'll also have some time for questions there. So I, um, I'm going to Jeff go Mahoney is next. Jeff, that's what I was thinking. He's in the middle of my screen. Jeff, go. Great. Uh, thank you. I want to go back to the last bullet point you have on, on page 10 about uh, non-public nature of the proceedings. As I understand it, that goes back to section 107 of Sarbanes-Oxley. And in the past, some former PCOB uh, uh, chairs have publicly expressed support for Congress to pass legislation to address that issue. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Section 107's impact on the effectiveness of your enforcement program and whether or not, you know, there's discussions going on with the new board about taking a public position uh, with respect to Section 107. Sure. Um, there have been uh, uh, proposed bills over time to make our enforcement proceedings public. Certainly, we in enforcement are very much in favor of that. And there have been cases that we certainly believe would not have litigated. They litigated. Uh, I, we think we had substantial evidence against the respondent, but the respondent wanted to continue in business while keeping um, the alleged misconduct quiet. Um, the Kabani case, which uh, went through both a hearing with uh, the hearing officer, went up to the board, went to the SEC, and then went to the Ninth Circuit, I think is a good example. Um, I think as we presented in that case, there was substantial evidence of complete non-cooperation, substantial alteration of work papers in advance of an inspection, yet he continued to fight the investigation and continued to keep auditing. So I think incentives are in place for folks, even who know they have committed a violation, to keep litigating, to keep the matter quiet as long as possible, to keep in business as long as possible. And so I think there are incentives there. And speaking for myself, I certainly uh, fully support the, uh, the bills that would make our disciplinary proceedings public. They also have, a, uh, they have, uh, they have an effect on us too. We should be held account to account in the division of enforcement if we bring a case and lose. So currently, if we bring a case and lose either before the hearing officer or the board, and that stays, that would stay quiet because the disciplinary proceedings are non-public. So we should also be held to account for the cases that we bring. So I think there are multiple reasons that we would be in favor of, of making the disciplinary process, the litigated hearings public. That's a great question, Jeff. Uh, and I think it, it highlights for both the board and the investor advisory group ways we can, um, uh, you know, have discussions about and or make recommendations to policymakers about how to improve the enforcement program at the PCOB. So who was next? Is it Nemet? Uh, thanks, Kara. Right. Uh, so this is perhaps a naive question uh, and a short one. Uh, what fraction of the fines that are imposed on firms and individuals are uh, collected? Uh, uh, I know that at least with the other regulators, sometimes it's it's much less than 100 percent. So uh, I don't know that that has been disclosed publicly. I will say, though, that the vast, vast majority have been collected. And we take steps to try to ensure that we're able to collect those. Great, thank you, Lynn. I, th I think you're on mute again. Thanks. Uh, along the lines of some of the disclosure uh, questions, obviously the SEC 102 proceedings are public, the PCOB are not how 
what factors do the SEC and you consider when making a determination as to whether to do have the SEC do the proceedings or uh, uh, keep them uh, behind closed doors and let the PCO um, be doing uh, PCO be doing. Then I got a question about the ALJ process. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, coordination with the SEC occurs during the investigative phase as well as leading up to any potential litigation. And so that is always something that is in the background. Um, we certainly want to investigate um, significant cases as much as possible, but that is a factor that I'm sure is in the SEC's mind from time to time and, and it does come up. Are there any particular factors you look at in deciding who does it? So usually the um, the the coordination takes place right at the beginning. It continues throughout, but usually there's a determination at the beginning of a matter. If we open a matter, we'll contact the SEC and the determination will be made whether we at the PCOB take the lead on the investigation or the SEC takes the lead on the investigation. and there are certain cases in which we'll both pursue the investigation. So most of those discussions take place at the early stage and the situation works itself out at the early stage. That does not preclude us from getting together pre-litigation and determining uh, you know, which, whether it makes sense for us to proceed or for the SEC to essentially take our record and proceed. Does the SEC get first pick? It's it's really a case by case basis. We have discussions depending on the particular facts of the case, depending on the source of the case, if it's an inspections referral, if it's a matter of interference with our processes. So it's really a case by case basis. Okay, okay. last question, Gina. I have at least he has a question too. Oh, sorry, I can't see her on my screen. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Right. Um, I have a somewhat naive question um, as well, and this is with regard to um, the ability to search um, the enforcement actions. As I can see right now, they're posted in PDF, which is the most search unfriendly version that you could possibly come up with. And when you, we're trying to kind of gather and do due diligence, it can be a real challenge. Um, to to I'm wondering if there's any kind of thought as to create a uh, moving towards something a little more search friendly. I'll defer to our tech folks on the answer to that question, but I think the search feature for the enforcement page has improved over time and even in the last few months. Um, recognizing that they're PDFs before it was very difficult even to search for. Um, a particular word within an enforcement order, we're able to do that now. Um, but there are discussions constantly about improving um, transparency and improving the board's website. Gina, great point. <laughs> well, <laughs> Thanks yeah, for the point, as, yeah. as we need to work on making things more accessible and transparent. Yeah, so yeah, data Someone has to think about data structure. Absolutely. It would make it a heck of a lot easier to do to diligence if the information is is more well structured. Absolutely, uh, great point. Um, and Alicia, I can't see you, but go ahead, ask your question. Not a problem, Carp. Thank you. Uh, you know the the focus around the investors, of course, is key. But it occurs to me when I put a different hat on, there's a lot of value here for another group of stakeholders, which are audit committees. And I think it. I, I think there's an opportunity to think about how to perhaps make available information that both uh, inspection as well as DEI uh, have available to them uh, accessible to a slightly different perspective. Because I would I would suggest that the perspectives are slightly different between an audit committee consideration versus an investor uh, consideration. Absolutely. 
you know, great point. Um, and so part of this in general is how do we improve transparency um, for all, all stakeholders, right? But particularly people who can help improve audit quality, right? If they're asking the right questions. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Barb Vanich, who will present from the office of the chief auditor. We'll do her presentation. I am probably gonna shorten the questions so you can have lunch. So I'm just pointing that out. Um, let me go ahead and let Barb present. Thank you, Kara. And um, good afternoon, advisory group members. It's, it's my pleasure to provide you with a brief overview of the Office of the Chief Auditor, or OCA as I'll refer to it. Uh, since we'll be spending some time on the agenda this afternoon, I'll keep my remarks brief and, and uh, tailored more to our process. So under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, uh, the PCOB acting in the public interest and for the protection of investors establishes by rule standards used by registered public accounting firms and the preparation and issuance of audit reports for public companies and broker dealers. We seek to establish and maintain high quality auditing standards and related professional standards for, in, for audits in support of our mission to protect investors and to further the public interest in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports. Uh, PCOB standards include auditing standards, attestation standards, quality control standards, and ethics and independent standards. And registered public accounting firms and their associated persons must comply with those standards in carrying out their duties. Uh, standards adopted by the board do not become effective unless they're approved by the SEC. Uh, next slide, please. So the Office of the Chief Auditor, or OCA, advises the board on the establishment and application of auditing and related professional practice standards, including uh, standards related to both the financial statements and ICFR of public companies, and the financial statements, compliance reports, and exemption reports of registered broker dealers. Uh, in addition to standard setting, OCA develops staff guidance and other staff publications. In developing standards and guidance, we work very collaboratively with our colleagues in the Division of Registration and Inspections, uh, Enforcement, and also our Office of Economic Research and Analysis and Office of General Counsel. Next slide, please. So we think about our activities primarily in, in three phases. On an ongoing basis, our staff devote time to understanding current and emerging audit issues. This can include, for example, monitoring other audit standard setters and regulators, or monitoring specific topics, for example, cryptocurrencies, developments in ESG reporting, or non-GAAP measures. Uh, we seek input internally from our colleagues and other divisions and also externally <clears throat> through the Office of External Affairs Outreach and now again through our advisory groups. As a result of these efforts, we may issue staff guidance or staff publication to highlight relevant audit considerations. Uh, we also might recommend an issue be included on our research agenda. So turning to our research projects, uh, with respect to the projects on the research agenda, we explore whether standard setting is needed, or is the right answer staff guidance or an alternative regulatory response, uh, for example, through inspections or enforcement? Uh, at this stage in our activities, we, ob we obtain input and seek diverse perspectives throughout the process. Uh, this may include getting uh, external input from advisory groups or, or from the public by issuing a concept release or a staff consultation paper. Uh, in, in this phase, we focus on identifying the problem and discuss potential solutions um, before we uh, work with our board on advancing something to the standard setting agenda. Now, for our standard setting projects, uh, we develop a standard and release with the ultimate goal of the board adopting a final standard. Uh, the standard setting phase generally includes issuing proposal to elicit public comment and based on the comments received, we may then issue a reproposal or, or a, recommend to the board a final standard. Um, so, so moving on 
although federal law does not require the PCOB to use particular rulemaking procedures, for example, the Administrative Procedures Act, the PCOB, like other standard setters and, and U.S. federal agencies, generally follows a notice and comment process to develop our standards. Uh, this typically involves issuing a propose, proposal for a comment. Uh, it can also involve additional steps, such as publishing a concept release to determine whether a proposal is needed and what form it might take, uh, or issuing, in some cases, a supplemental request for comment to refine an original proposal. Uh, and sometimes uh, we seek input in advance of proposed rulemaking uh, through, through other vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. An important aspect of our standard setting process includes economic considerations, uh, which include considering the need for the rule, uh, the baseline or set another way, what is current practice, the alternatives considered by the board, along with the potential benefits, costs, and, and unintended consequences. Uh, when we're publishing a proposal or final standard, we describe as clearly as possible the need for standard setting and explain how, in our view, the standard would meet that need. Uh, to assess the potential economic effects of new or revised standards, we first establish a baseline in practice against which to measure the potential impacts of the new or revised standard. Uh, the baseline analysis generally discusses the current standards that the new or revised standard will affect, as well as information about regarding the wide range of audit performance and market behavior found in practice. Uh, next slide, please. Another matter you'll you'll see discussed in our releases is the emerging growth is, is emerging growth companies. So under the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act of 2012, or the, or the JOBS Act uh, for short, rules adopted by the PCOB do not apply to audits of emerging growth companies unless the SEC determines that application of the additional requirements is necessary or appropriate in the public interest after considering the protection of investors and whether the action will promote efficiency, competition, and capital formation. Uh, we're aided very closely by our colleagues in the Office of Economic Research and Analysis in considering the effects of, of a standard on emerging growth companies. Uh, OERA, as I'll, I'll refer to them, actually publishes a white paper periodically on emerging growth companies, which is available on our website. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to standard setting, uh, our office may issue staff guidance to highlight new, emerging, or otherwise noteworthy issues. Um, we, we also support the implementation of our standards and rules to improve the quality of audit services through outreach, written guidance, webinars, or other channels. Uh, we develop guidance related to the application of PCOB standards and rules and participate and speak at events and, and develop materials uh, also for external webcasts, uh, for example, and also our forum on small business, uh, small business forums. Uh, example publications that, that you may have seen come out from us uh, was a staff spotlight that was intended to highlight certain audit um, considerations relevant to, to the invasion of the Ukraine. And we also issued several staff, staff publications related to the impact of COVID-19 potentially on the audits. Uh, that really brings me to the end of my prepared remarks since we'll be spending this afternoon together, but uh, I think we have a few minutes to take questions, Kara, if that works for you. That works for me. Okay, Hal. Jeff Mahoney. Oh, Hal went first, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hal, go ahead. Yeah, I'm used to being an investor. Get my question in there first. Um, <laughs> Barbara, I, I was intrigued by that comment about EGCs. I know that they don't have to, under the Jobs Act, follow certain accounting standards, and that's a disclosure on the front of the 10Qs and 10Ks. Is there a comparable disclosure that maybe certain audit standards aren't being followed? Is there some retrievable in fact, I think what Jennifer said, you know, it's nice to have retrievable information. Is there someplace I could retrieve that information where the um, certain audit standards are not being not, applied? 
not through their filings, Hal, but um, we would list on our websites to, to you know, what standards apply. Um, for, for example, uh, the disclosure of critical audit matters was not required for emerging growth companies, uh, whereas most of our performance standards, like, for example, our auditing standards on estimates and specialists would be applicable. But, yeah, e EGCs are not required to disclose that anywhere. But, it, but, it, but for accounting standards, it's optional. So That's is correct. that the case here? Um, I suppose it, it could be, uh, since, since we haven't made that many uh, recommendations for the determination. It, it, it's probably not a lot of uh, interesting information out there, but but certainly something to think about. Maybe at some point we can talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Thanks. Okay, Jeff. Thanks for the presentation, Barbara. Uh, one question. I wonder if you talk a little bit about the the line between staff guidance and standard setting. You know, some have suggested to me that that uh, maybe the PCOB should devote more resources to, to staff guidance, given all that needs to be done. I wonder uh, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. And uh, cer certainly interested in um, observations from members, but staff guidance is not, has no authority. It's not a rule of the board and it really can't be in enforced against or inspected to. Um, so from the staff perspective, I mean, there's probably a need for both. Uh, however, we're very excited to have such a, a full agenda and, and really look forward to, to replacing and amending some of, some of these older standards. Okay, uh, Jennifer. Uh, Barbara, could you share with us some, if, um, some more clarity on how you evaluate the cost and benefits of the standards? And in particular, how prominent are user and investor benefits considered in the calculus? Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. I will try to do that justice, but in full disclosure, I'm not an economist. And so, so if any of our, our folks in OER are listening, maybe this is something we could bring, bring them back at another time to have a more detailed discussion. But um, the standard setting teams consist of both uh, personnel from the Office of the Chief Auditor along with personnel from the Office of Economic Research and Analysis, and the teams work very closely together uh, to really identify what we believe is the delta, the change from the current standard. Um, at, as you can imagine, we have a lot of information available at our disposal from the Division of Registration and Inspections. And so we seek to understand what change would be, you know, would it be a change that affected smaller firms more or larger firms more? Uh, and then, and then we would seek to also ask questions in any proposing release uh, for data requests for, uh, related to any costs or benefits. Benefits um, are certainly a little more challenging to to quantify, um, and so the staff does their best with the information they have. But, but again, probably a, a better um, it would be better to have someone from OERA talk about that in a little more detail with you all. No, I think that's a great idea as a presentation uh, at a future meeting. Um, Parveen. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the question that I have relates to the non-accelerated filers under the JOBS Act. And we understand that the PCOB is following the rules which are implemented by the commission. Uh, what I'm wondering is, uh, since the exemption uh, was granted to the non-accelerated filers a while back, plenty of academic research has come out that uh, in summary indicates that the financial reporting quality of such companies is subpar. And uh, so the question that arises is uh, that is there anything PCOB is doing in a proactive sense to uh, persuade uh, the decision makers in other agencies or in your conversations, even with the Congress, to perhaps reconsider that exemption that has been put in place, knowing that we have some evidence to the fact now that financial reporting quality of the companies which are exempted is definitely of subpar quality. Uh, n nothing official going on that, that really I can talk about, but certainly a very interesting comment that we're, we're happy to take away and discuss. 
Yeah, a great comment, Parveen, and involves the SEC and the Congress uh, going forward. But part of this is bringing uh, at what have we learned, right, since the JOBS Act was passed? What data do we have and what is the data showing? So I think it's a, a really important conversation to have and it would be great to have you guys engaged in it. Okay, I am gonna break us for lunch. If people could come back at 1245, that would be great uh, to get ready for the, the next part of the meeting. And uh, it's fine to eat while, uh, you know, and have your screen off if you would like to do that for the, uh, the further presentation. Thanks. See you guys soon.